Hello, and welcome to Halting Towards Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I'm your host today, Brian Brew, and I'm joined by Greg Uttinger and Emily Maxson. Today we'll be discussing general revelation, what what creation reveals about God and other related topics. I'll just turn it over right to you, Greg. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is a detour, sort of from our discussion of covenant and contract. And I think it's necessary to slow down and, and, and look at this in some detail. Because sooner or later, as you look at a civil constitution, a marriage license, a concept of marriage and of family law and such, you have to ask the question, where does the law come from? And having said that, let's say we all, for some reason, marvelously agree it's God. Which God? And all right, so the triune God of Scripture. The next question has to be, how does he communicate to us? And when he does, how do we know that it's him? And that has to take us back to how God revealed himself from the beginning in his creation, how he still reveals himself, and to what degree we can understand that revelation. So I would like to read a rather lengthy section, uh, two sections actually, from the book of Romans. And so please, everyone listening, bear with me. Paul writes in Romans 1, verse 17, to 16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God, and to salvation to every one that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it's written, the just shall live by faith. So he's setting up his theme for the book, which is a quote from Habakkuk, the just shall live by his faith. And he's going to explain that the gospel reveals the righteousness which is in Christ, which we apprehend by faith. But in order for that to make any sense, he needs to talk about sin first. And he begins with unbelievers who don't have the Bible, who've never heard the gospel. Can they sin? And to what degree are they responsible and accountable for God since they don't have the Bible? And he begins like this. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. And I think I'll comment as I go rather than reading it all and coming back again. So there is a revelation from heaven to earth to men, and it's directed against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who, the King James says, hold the truth in unrighteousness. And the word hold means to suppress, to have, but to push down out of sight. So right there, he's given us his basic thesis about general revelation. Yes, the heavens themselves declare the glory of God. All nature sings to us of who he is. We have this revelation. We have this truth, not only potentially. We really do have it. And yet in having it, before we come to Christ, we are suppressing it, we are holding it down, we're not looking at it, we're not receiving it, and yet it is indelibly there. And he's going to expand on that now. Because that which be, may be known of God is manifest in them. So first of all, this general revelation or natural revelation, terms are more or less the same, is manifest within mankind, within man himself. There is a revelation not only external, to him, but within him. He is, after all, the image of God. That's his definition. It's not something added on top of his basic uh, nature or character. It is his basic nature and character, however corrupted by sin it may be. So this, this knowledge, and the verb tense is present, is manifest, still manifest in them, for God has showed it unto them. So there the emphasis seems to be, and it's in the next verse will clearly be, not only what's in us, but with around us. We look at the world around us, and this is what he says, verse 20. For the invisible things of him, that would be God's attributes, things that we cannot perceive directly, because God's invisible, transcendent. The invisible things of him from, or since the creation of the world, so since man was created, since the world was created, God has revealed himself in his word, being the author of creation, he has left his impress upon it. Now, we've all had the experience of hearing a song for the first time. Well, I assume we have. Hearing a song for the first time or maybe seeing a 
a painting or even in my case, reading a comic book and looking at the artwork or hearing the sound and saying, I've never seen this before, but I bet that that's, that's Bach, that's Lennon, that's John Williams or um, in comic books, that's George Perez, that's John Byrne. Uh, the uh, authors have a style, a signature, something that points back to themselves. And yet human authors are derivative and learn from one another and learn from those who are gone past. And every human author style is derivative, at least now in some extent, from other humans who've gone before. But God made the universe by himself. And so there is no, no one he's borrowing from. There were no, there were no other gods besides him kibitzing and throwing, why don't you say this? Ooh, make it blue, or things like that. It all came from out of the heart and mind of God as a sovereign creator. The, the invisible things that are from the creation of the world are clearly seen being understood by or by means of the things that are made. So it's a passive verb, but the idea is that mankind is capable and in fact does in some measure understand who and what God is because of the things that God has put there from the beginning being the author of those very things. And Paul's, well, first he tells us at least in summary, two of the things that he's talking about. Um, the invisible things include his eternal power, that is, he's a sovereign creator. He brought all this into existence. He made it in all of its detail, with all its creativity and wisdom. And Godhead, he's not like us. He's not part of creation. He's not the mind of the universe. He's not an energy force inherent in all living things. He is a transcendent God who outside of himself made all of this by his own will. So his eternal power and God, that at least men ought to see because it's plain before them. The question becomes, will they? And so he, he'll, his last line in this argument is, so that they are without excuse. God's revelation in, in nature and within man is so clear, so self-evident, and, and even obvious, which is not the same thing as self-evident, that men ought to see this. The ought being not only the practical, open your eyes, it's right there, but the moral and legal, you are obligated to see this. It is not for any want in the way God made you that you don't see this. The defect exist in your own choices, in your own nature, which you, in fact, have chosen. You've inherited from Adam, and yet you continue to choose your unbelief and to try to hold down this revelation. Because that when they knew God, St. Paul assumes that there were historically were times when all humanity did know God, and we can pick out two real fast, at least. When Adam and Eve left the garden, were driven from the garden, the cherubim and the flaming sword behind them, and they looked down upon the howling wilderness beyond. They both knew, and that was all humanity at the time, they knew who the God of the Bible was, and they in fact did embrace his promises. And as their children came along, they taught them to believe those promises. Later, when Noah and his family looked down from Mount Ararat into the new world God had given them, they too, everyone there, had just seen humanity destroyed by a flood, and they at least formally, we don't know their hearts, but at least formally all acknowledged that this happened not by some cosmic accident or a collision of a comet or some such thing, but this was God's judgment. It was the God who had revealed himself to Adam and to the patriarchs afterwards, that in fact had revealed himself in what was becoming the Bible, the books that Adam and Noah had written. And um, yeah, that this, is, this God is God. So there were times in history when men knew God and yet very quickly in each of these cases, we're told that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful. They didn't want to treat him and regard him as God. Yeah, they may acknowledge his name. They may chalk him up as one God among many. They may speak of, yes, uh, there's Jehovah and there's Baal and there's Jupiter and whatever. But they did not set him apart as the transcendent God as, that he reveals himself to be the only God. And one of the reasons was that they were not thankful. They were not thankful for his word, for his providences, for their situation, for their human limitations, for God's judgments. They were not thankful for his salvation and his good gifts. They, because 
the basic nature of sin is man wants to be God, and anyone who stands in that role, we can't be thankful for because, hey, that's my chair. Get out. I mean, I'm not thankful that you're taking my throne. Um, and so it manifests itself in lots of complaining, lots of uh, failure to worship God and to turn one's attention to worship towards something else, some extension of one's own being. Because of that, Paul says, they became vain, empty, foolish in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Uh, there's a progression here, and it carries on through the rest of the chapter. First, they're not thankful for who God is. Because of that, their imaginations already being tainted by sin become darker. Their foolish heart was darkened because of this choice. By refusing to believe in God, little by little, everything was eaten away. Everything turns dark. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. So they pursued what they said was wisdom. You can think here of the Greeks, for instance. And yet, although it's looks smart and has lots of fancy words and is spoken in complicated sentence structures uh, and with abstract ideas, when all is said and done, it's a lot of hooey, uh, as my first pastor would have said. It's nonsense. It doesn't hold together. It doesn't make sense. It's not consistent with reality. What about he, the, the truly wise man is the one who knows that he knows nothing? <laughs> Well, the answer to that, of course, is the truly wise man is the man who knows the God who reveals himself in the man's very act of knowing. Agnosticism is not something to brag about, <laughs> whether it be ag agnosticism toward God or one's own reality. Descartes was a fool when he doubted everything around him. He did not need to go back doubting all the way to himself and then find steady ground in his own autonomy. Now, on a superficial level, sure, you can say... In fact, Paul does say something like that, that with regard to practical matters or deep theology, sometimes we do need to say, uh, such thoughts are too high for me, I can't understand them, or let him be In a other words, dude, that's wise. us. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let's, <laughs> let, let, let's chill and bring it down to what has God actually said. Let's start with, uh, with the easy stuff and then work on it, because we may be... Um, exalting our our own intellect and pretensions. The solution is not to say, well, I can't know anything, because God <laughs> says you can, and you ought to. Right. Uh, so thank you. That was That's a good question. E even any person that you talk to off the street who has not darkened the door of a philosophy lecture room will be able to tell you, oh, yeah, I know things. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know that it's safe to cross the street when I've looked both ways. I know I that I can go. Yeah, when the light is green. Yeah. I, I remember reading something about uh, somebody went to a philosophy class and like it, they they had their final test or whatever. Mm. And I don't remember if it was the only question, but it might have been. And it was like, prove to me the chair doesn't exist. And the only person who like got an A, I guess it was um, graded on a curve, but the only person who got an A was the one who said. What chair? <laughs> <laughs> what is a chair? <laughs> what what is a chair? Unless he put the word chair in quotes, he's still giving something away because mm -hmm. mm. he knows by by using using the word chair to deny his knowledge of the chair. He's admitted that he at least knows what a ch chair is. Now we're only open up to whether or not there's one right here. Uh, <laughs> the, the the only consistent response would be a complete solipsism or nihilism that says, that actually says nothing, because there's nothing to say, because there's nothing to speak from. But the moment we say, may make any knowledge claim, we, we are making claims about reality. First of all, that there is such a thing, and that it is in some sense distinct from the one making the claim at the moment. I, I say there's no chair. Well, then there's I... And there's at least the non-existence of a chair, which is not me, because if the chair is me, then I would have to say the chair does exist. There's um, also the communicability of truth. Yeah, yeah. If you say something, it's because you intend someone to understand you. Yeah. And you're saying that you, in fact, understand yourself. Mm -hmm. That the words you formulate are not simply impressions or emotional experiences but that this truth can be put into words. And this is something of what Paul is talking about. There's no getting away from God's reality. 
but it is very much God's reality. And if you try to posit something else than God as the starting point, even these these simple assurances fall away. Mm -hmm. how, how do we know that we know? How do we know these words mean anything? What are words anyway? And who am I to make any pronouncement about anything? How, words are how... just social constructs, man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's interesting that you say that because that's exactly the progression that we've seen or devolvement. <laughs> that's a better word than progression. Yeah. Is regression. The, the impulse of the natural man is to deny as much as you can get away with, right? Mm -hmm. And there was a time when you couldn't get away with denying the truth of two plus two equals four. Yeah. But in the last few years, we've seen, oh, I might be able to get away with that. Let's try it. See yeah, what happens. Let's see what happens. <laughs> it's all, well, I mean, it's all colonialist anyway. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. You know, yeah. Western we, we, imperialism. We learned this from the British and the Americans and the French, and um, they interrupted our our own native way of looking at reality. It may be that two plus two is four, and suddenly in 1984 but not for all is two. Yeah, 1984 <laughs> is coming back to me. Yes, two plus two, maybe four, if for our purposes. But if we wanted to be five, it is. How many fingers do you see? Of course, it's one thing to teach this to kindergartners in the classroom. Two plus two is four-ish. Five, five. Okay, that's that's good. That's your way of thinking about it. We can work with that. But you don't and that's build how bridges. To mess up a child for life. <laughs> yeah, but you don't build. He's never going to be an engineer because engineers don't build bridges based on two plus two is something around the area of four. <laughs> there are absolutes of thought that have concrete consequences. And there's the, relative the clarity because, like, you do get down to a certain decimal point sure. and say close enough. But yeah. it has to be enough, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and we're capable of communicating what that close enough is, mm -hmm. largely by building bridges, running trains across them and finding out, whoops, well, that wasn't close enough. <laughs> um, and we don't make that mistake again. And then now we're inserting certainties about memory and time. That mm -hmm. happened in the past. Where's the past? You can't see it or touch it or feel it. And yet I remember it. Is that memory valid? Why is it valid? Um, and, and science fiction has dealt humorously with that any number of times. So there, there is a great deal that the human being takes for granted, cannot in fact help for taking for granted consistently. You know, the, the pantheist can say one plus one is one and, and insist upon it religiously in, in both senses of the word. Um, but when it comes to building bridges or mixing explosives, He's going to appeal to Western science and Western counting, or he's going to blow himself up. Well, you know that I really feel that three sodium atoms should come out of this yes. uh, equation. <laughs> so it, that's, that's going to happen if I combine uh, bleach and ammonia. Yeah. I feel it in my heart. And certainly nobody has a right to overturn my sincerely felt convictions about what I am doing. Okay, we're, we're, we're beginning to edge toward what I would like to talk about before we're done, and that's ethics. Mm -hmm. Because one of the things that men know or don't know is right from wrong. And Paul's going to address that, but we need to go a little bit further. So with that in mind, we go on. So men are changing the glory of the uncorruptible God into an, Im into an image made like to corruptible man, speaking of devolution. They started by worshiping other men or images of men, often their ancestors and their dead kings. And to birds, at least they're in the heavens, four-footed beasts to prowl the earth, and then creeping things, scarabs, dung beetles, things like that. So men, in not being thankful for God, did not stop being worshiping creatures, but they turned their worship toward the creation and step by step, generation by generation, century by century, what they worship became more and more distant from the God who is. They started with man, with God's image, which is man, but quickly depart from that until they're, they're worshiping bugs. God, and, and there is, again, there's a progression here. Wherefore, because of this, because they would not think honestly and truly about God, because they would not accept the revelation within them and without them, God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. So, as man 
self-consciously turned from God, God withdrew the remnants of his grace, as we use the term common grace, if you will, his, his restraining grace, his spirit striving with man to keep sin in check. God began to remove that, uh, basically let them be them. And what happened was that they turned to immorality of all sorts, and he highlights here particularly sexual immorality. He gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts, notice the lust originates in their hearts, and who they really are, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. And he's going to come back to that. And again, he reminds us why this is, who changed the truth of God into a lie, and worship and serve the creature more than the Creator who is blessed forever. Amen. So again, it's about worshiping the creature because you're not thankful to the God who is, who you in fact know, but you don't want to know. For this cause, so he's going to echo and, and expand upon what he just, just said. For this cause, because they're worshiping the creation, God gave them up unto vile affections. Ooh, there's an absolute. He doesn't say unusual. He doesn't even say unnatural, although those would both be true. He says vile. That's a, a critical evaluation. These affections, these passions, these desires are vile in God's sight. God does not approve of them, this God who made the universe. God gave them over to vile affections, and he cites two examples. Um, they may be two, they may be one, depending on how you interpret the text. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. That may be referring to homosexuality. I'm going to follow Shafi here and suggest that it refers to prostitution because generally men are, when, when society gets that bad, men are blamed before women. In fact, there's one of the minor prophets that said, yeah, I'm the, your, your women are going after lovers. I'm not going to punish them because you started it, you men. You're, the, the, the blame is yours. So if this is, this, it might be a lesbianism, prostitution possibly. But whatever they did, women were not created to be prostitutes, to surrender their bodies to men's lust for money. That's not the way God made the world. It is not, in that sense, natural at all. It may, it may be doing what the people involved feel is okay, but their feelings are wrong. Their feelings, it's the feelings that are not natural. And therefore the act, uh, the vile act is not natural. It's against nature. But now the next one is very clearly directed at sodomy. Likewise, also the men leaving the natural use of the woman burned in their less one toward another, men with men working that which is unseemly, light word, considering all the other words he's using, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error, which was me, which was appropriate. So this is because they changed, because they refused to tell the difference between God and a dung beetle. God says, well, fine, I'm going to put you in the sea. I'm going to withdraw my grace from you so that you can't tell the difference of a man from a woman. Oh, we're kind of there, aren't we? Or how about you can't tell your own gender anymore? If you will not believe in the Creator God, the most basic things that everybody seems to always have known, you're a man, I'm a woman, or I'm a man, you're a woman, will be gone from you. You'll have no firm basis. You won't know. And... The consequence of this, particularly here in describing sodomy, because he's describing not only the ideas or opinions, but the actual acts, he says, they receive in themselves that recompense of their error, which was appropriate. This is before AIDS or HIV. Mm -hmm. This is not talking about STDs. <laughs> no, it's not. It's talking about what you do to yourself spiritually and psychologically, emotionally, mentally, intellectually, when you go this far. It's it's not a natural act, and it affects everything about you, your ability to understand and discern. And we, we keep seeing that more and more in, in our age in the last 20 years, where more and more people are questioning basic realities. The last couple generations questioned whether or not the, the fetus in the womb is a baby or a piece of tissue. That's not exactly something that society really has struggled with. And certainly not where the gospel has gone. But that was up for grabs. Big bang from the creator. Yeah, that's... No. Um, <laughs> and now we're, we're at gender. Um, other things. Um, what is fascism? Fascism is you telling me 
that I can't practice my sexual perversity and use my uh, illegal drugs any way I want. In fact, if you're not going to pay for me, you're a fascist. That's not what that word means. <laughs> but um, people will use it that way. They, they no longer have any sense of, of correct interpretation. Love, mercy, justice. These words do not mean what they used to mean. Peace. Peace. Mm -hmm. And again, back to 1984, war is peace. Freedom of slavery. He was a prophet. He saw where this had to go. Words become manipulation tools by a governing elite using the media to make people go along with the thing, the program, believing all the while that this is, in some sense, right and proper. And because they have no standard by which to critique it or to judge it. There's no absolute beyond the system. And, and so we're left with what we have. And no appeal, except I don't like this. Well, you may not like it, but compared to the millions of people who seem just fine with it, your vote no longer counts. Well, continuing. And, and if that wasn't bad enough, even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, unless they didn't like it, they did not want to think about God, talk about God, believe in God, believe in the right God, think about God in a biblical fashion. Because of that, God gave them over to a reprobate mind, the margin says a mind void of judgment. They were no longer capable of making rational judgments about morality. And so they followed their immorality freely, passionately, enthusiastically at times, sometimes sadly, realizing that this is somehow bad. I don't feel happy when it's done, and yet I keep doing it, because their mind no longer has the capability of judging between God and creation, man and woman, tissue and baby, um, peace and war, slavery and freedom, and, and that carries on through everything between right and wrong. They, they don't have those, even the categories begin to disappear. And the only thing that becomes evil to them is anyone telling them they ought to obey God. And he begins to list what happens. God having, again, and this is not God making them evil. This is God simply withdrawing his grace that kept them from their evil. In other words, the punishment for sin is being left to sin. Mm -hmm. it's, it, he, he just pulls back the restraints and people become more fully themselves. But rather than being, becoming antichrists who rule the world, they descend into gross immorality where they can't even rule themselves. And here's kind of drives home the point that God is the source of all good. That yeah. as you withdraw from him, the only, like, you know, when you let a child do something that you know is going to hurt them a little bit so that yeah. they will learn. Yeah. This is not that. Because <laughs> yes, this is the that. goal is fellowship with God. Mm-hmm. And so you're not going to learn that you need to have fellowship with God by rejecting fellowship with God. No. So the only way to be redeemed from this is to have God say, no, I'm going to put you back in fellowship with me. Yeah. And, 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 and he, this, this is, a, uh, in some sense, a fine point of theology, although it's actually very blatant. But if God lets them tumble on into their sins... Uh, and they do really wicked, stupid things. Aren't they possibly at some point going to hurt themselves or their family bad enough that it's going to be a wake-up call that will drive them back to God? And the answer is, uh, if that's the extent of your question, the answer's got to be no. And we're going to see that a little bit when we talk about the rich man in hell. Uh, mm -hmm. No, no, no threat of punishment, no execution of punishment will drive men back to God because God is the source of all good, as you just said. Now, if God, in that moment of despair, brings to you his gospel or, or quickens it to your heart, you having already heard it, he may indeed use that as part of a wake-up call, but it will be his word that changes your heart, not the suffering or the fear or the torment in and of itself. Well, um, I mean, you, you will simply explain it away. There's a material cause and secondary cause. Yes. The material cause is God's spirit working, but he may use a secondary means, yeah. not not secondary cause, secondary means yeah. uh, to enact it. Yeah. God can make use of such things, but they in themselves are inadequate because that's how bad man is. We keep hoping, I know there's something good in you. 
Um, <laughs> no. <laughs> quoting, from my favorite, <laughs> quoting from my favorite movie. Um, Tangent. Yeah. Uh, the Redwell books. Uh-huh. I love how they deal with that. It's like, I believe that there is a little bit of good in this villain. And then another character says, yeah, I believe he'll be good someday. Good and dead. <laughs> Constance the Badger is the best. <laughs> yeah. So there you go. Um, but we don't we don't want to do that. And often in movies and TV, the, the one who insists on on the absolute depravity of the individual and the need for his or her death, uh, often one who does in fact have the have the authority to execute, will back off and say. But there must be mercy, or there must be some good, or look, she, I know that all her life she's been a mass murderer, but at this last second she saved your life. So, or even worse, <laughs> be like, but if we do that, then we're just as bad. Oh yes, yes. Yeah. If we oh, do that, man. we're just as bad. Yeah, yeah. Sure. Uh, I hate uh, Batman. I, I remember. I hate it see, so much. <laughs> you, you. I was just thinking of something related to to Batman. Actually, it was like Batman talking to <laughs> Superman, and he goes, "You know, <sighs> Superman, do you think like I've been wrong to to not you know take out these these villains permanently?" And Superman goes, "Like, no, you've always been doing the right thing. It's it's not right. They're suffering in their own mental he- like hell of some sort." And you're going on, it's like, yeah, just, I've been dealing with the Joker lately. Oh, no, you should have killed that guy years ago. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Preach. <laughs> oh, oh Yeah. And I don't know how many TV shows I've seen where someone's hanging by their fingertips from a ledge of a very tall building and the good guy's up there and has the, cho- the, the choice, do I save them or not? And and sometimes you can say, all right, you're going to save him so he stands trial. Good enough. That's but you're going to save him and put him back on the same footing as you and start the battle again. That was dumb. Um, <laughs> he, he got there be, by his own sins. And if someone can apprehend him and bring him before a lawful judge who can execute lawful judgment, that is the preferred method. But uh, if you are, if you have the authority... You know, we have. There's a question of authority here, but the question of whether or not this this man being a mass murderer many times over and it known to be true, there there is due process, but there's also the reality. And if that due process takes its course, he's going to die. It's not going to be a question of of mercy or there's some good in you or we can we can rehabilitate you. We're we're <laughs> we're past that barbarism. We can we can remold your character either by kindness or by shock therapy, by mind wipe. Uh, that's that's not it. Uh, and in I'm- passing, I recommend an episode of uh, the late limited Babylon Five called mm-hmm. Passing Through Gethsemane. Where a man who is now a monk finds out that he has been mind wiped and he has forgotten his past, in which he was the serial killer, mm. and he he realizes he owes a debt to ju- to justice, and he also complains, "How can I ask God to forgive my sins when I can't even remember what they are?" I think it's a good wrestling with this whole issue: Is human nature fixed, and are you responsible for your past? Well, the Bible says you are. And that outside of Christ, your nature is fixed into growing sin, into a deeper self-conscious hatred of God and rejection of God, and that no external thing, force, threat, torment, accident, act of God, lightning strike, is going to change that. It takes the work of God's Holy Spirit to the gospel. And on the flip side, that no temporal judgment is directly equated to God's judgment. That if you repent and are a Christian and find yeah. refuge in Christ, you can still submit to earthly justice yeah. and know that eternally you are safe in Christ and you are forgiven. Yeah. Yeah. Paul, Paul stands before the Roman magistrate and says, if I've committed things worthy of death, I refuse not to die. Mm-hmm. That's, oh, he's a Christian now. We must, we must not punish him. That's not our decision. Uh, that's God has told us what to do, and but you say the man will then be welcomed into glory if his repentance and his faith are true. Well, I mean, let me let me go. I, on. I remember a. Uh, mm-hmm. I don't know if you said it or somebody else said it, but there was a 
serial killer in Japan who Mm -hmm. was arrested and through the ministry of somebody in the jail came to faith. And the, the, the sort of, I just forgot their names. They're like the big Christian movie directors, but you know, the, the Christian movie ending would be, Oh, he came to faith. Therefore he's not going to be put to death. It's going to be like this restoration thing. And it's, no, instead, he, he said, like, wow, I did horrible things, and I'm going to submit to mm. execution because that is what justice is for the sins that I have committed, for the crimes I've done yeah. against God's image. And he says, I'm, I know where I'm going now. I'm, I'm going to go to heaven. I'm going to be with God. But I've forfeited, essentially, yeah. continuing existence because of what I've done. Yeah. I don't get... I don't get out of this because yeah. of my repentance. And so he submitted to it. And there is something excellent in that as oh, far absolutely. as absolutely. personal character is concerned. You don't you don't do it just to get out of consequences, you know. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Well, here's a list. I'm I'm keeping my eye on the clock and I don't know if we'll do everything I'd hoped, but it's okay. Um, I think it's important to talk through these verses. These next, however, are a list of sins, just so we're very clear. These are things that people do because, Paul has said, they have a reprobate mind. They cannot discern between good and evil. That does not mean there's no discernment at all. But in the moment, these things seem perfectly fine. Hey, it's me. Yes, this is bad, but I was treated worse. Yes, this is bad, but you don't understand the circumstances. Um, Here are some of these things. Being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who, knowing the judgment of God, notice the word knowing, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, they know what God says about them, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. So here's a whole catalog of where mankind ultimately ends up in their rebellion against God. It's not just a theological thing or epistemological thing, it's an ethical thing. When you don't believe in the God of the Bible, that is, you refuse to believe in him, you shut or put out your eyes, close your ears, will not listen, will not think, push everything down, this is what happens to you, this is what happens to your culture. Now, given that, it would be easy to say, well, then these people actually are incapable of understanding morality at all. So if they do something good, we ought to be thankful they even got that right. Because uh, they, they, they no longer do have a sense of, of right and wrong, and that's not their fault. It's their culture. It's the way they were raised. It's their inheritance from them and so on. And so Paul, in the next chapter, immediately says, no, wrong, eh, wrong conclusion, Therefore thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest, for wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself, for thou that judgest doeth the same things. Paul's argument is, wait, you, you, you've, you've gone too far. I am not saying that, the, that natural man, fallen man, has no concept of right and wrong, just that it's horribly perverse, because you, whoever he's talking to, the, the Gentile without the Bible, If someone steps on your toes, for instance, it matters to you whether it was an accident or they did it on purpose. You know there's such a thing as human responsibility. You know that someone purposely hurts you. You feel you have a right to be angry and maybe to take a swing back at them or step on their toes. Um, Someone steals from you. You say, hey, that's wrong. You may feel free to cheat with other men's wives. When they go after your wife, you say, that's wrong. Um. You may steal uh, $20, but someone steals a million dollars from you. You say, that's wrong. Well, $20, that's nothing. That was just a joke. But a million dollars, that's wrong. We do this. And Paul says, whatever you, anytime you condemn something in another person, anytime you say, that's wrong, make a moral, ethical judgment, you're admitting that there is a moral, ethical standard. Furthermore, if you look honestly at your life, you will see you have broken that standard at exactly the same point. Mm-hmm. Maybe not to the same degree or in the same way, but that ethical standard, if you were allowed to flesh it out a little bit, you would see you have, in fact, done the same thing. So every time you say that's wrong, 
you are acknowledging an absolute beyond yourself, a standard beyond yourself that you didn't create, and you are saying that you yourself have violated it. Now, what's important here, um, especially for our next week's discussion, is he doesn't say that your standard, that you're interpreting the standard fully or correctly. Um, that's, that's not necessary. All that's necessary here is to understand that you are acknowledging a standard beyond yourself that is binding on you and the person who hurt you, which means it's not you. There is someone bigger than you who has said absolutely some things are right or some things are wrong, and they are after this fashion. Um, I know a number of times when I've done chapel messages for the younger kids, uh, I'll say something. So, you all, you, would you all agree that it's wrong to steal? Oh, yeah, it's wrong to steal. Everybody, all the heads. If your hand, it's, do you think stealing is wrong? Right now? Okay. Ever stole a Twinkie from your neighbor's lunch? Actually, I start with, ever steal a million dollars? No. Ah, ever steal a Twinkie from your neighbor's lunch? And usually I get giggling. I say, no. Which is more important to God, a million dollars or a Twinkie? Which one does he need more? <laughs> Uh, won't they both define God in your heart? Oh, mm. um, and and I give other examples like that. Little things against big things. Oh, big things. Yeah, those are bad. Little things. Oh, well, you know, yeah, I do that, but I don't mean anything by that. Doesn't hurt anybody. That's not a real sin. Um, about that. <laughs> yeah, about that. It's no, it's that that sin. You are a little person and you are sinning little because that's all you're capable of. But where is this going as you get bigger and have more competence and power and authority? Uh, what's what's the difference ultimately since it's a hard issue? And so that's what Paul is saying here. You 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 have the sense that there are these big... I mean, all the people who go into the streets and rage against social injustice. Well, you know what? They've admitted that there's such a thing as injustice. Mm -hmm. They may not understand correctly what it is. They have a vague flickering, but that big vague flickering is enough to hold them account. If you could sit down and talk with them, say, all right, so you think it's wrong to take things from people, to oppress them when they're innocent. Did you just break that shopkeeper's window? Whoa, man, but he's part of the system. Did you just break? Well, when did you take away the property of a man who worked very hard to have it? And you, in a moment of your personal anger, just took it away from him. Isn't that, how is that not oppression? And you start, and the person starts making excuses, but it becomes very clear at that point that there is a, a legal guilt here, legal responsibility before God, because he does know enough to know that he's violated even his own standards. And with our time running out, I want to jump down to um, several verses. Verse 14, actually verse 12. Verse 11, I'll find it here in a moment. For there's no respect of persons with God, for as many as have sinned without law shall also perish without law. So the question is, but the Gentiles don't have law, that is the law from Sinai, the law in the Bible, how can you hold them accountable? Well, he's been proving that. So if they don't have the law, then they're going to die without the law. They're going to go to hell without the law. They lived without it, they're going to die without it. And as many as have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. You're a Jew, you have the law, then you're more accountable more responsible, but the other person's responsible too. And he explains why. For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, by nature do the things contained in the law, these having not the law, are a law unto themselves, which showed the work of the law written in their hearts, and their conscience also bearing them um, bearing them witness and their thoughts, oh, I'm sorry, let me say that again, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another in the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. And then he goes and talks to the Jews about their responsibility. But uh, the, the words I think here that are uh, important for us they showed the work of the law written in the heart. doesn't say they showed the law written in their heart, but the work, the activity, the remnants, the effect. Being the image of God, there is something left there that says God is, he ought to be obeyed, and here you have some notion of what that law looks like. And you can go into the worst parts of America and ask people, is it wrong to kill another human being? And almost uniformly, people will say, well, yes. 
Well, then how about children of the womb? Well, they don't count. How about old people? Well, they're up for grabs. How about somebody who is very terminally sick and wants to die? Well, yeah, you could kill them. See, step by step, someone's, someone's pulling a gun on you because they caught you in your in their liquor store trying to rob you. Well, you know, I can shoot him because he shouldn't be he shouldn't be killing me. I need to get out alive. I got a family. You know, we 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 start qualifying. Is it wrong to steal? Well, yeah, you shouldn't steal. Well, we're back to and you broke that guy's window. You uh, cheated on your taxes. You didn't pay God his tithe, and, and so it goes. Is is it wrong to steal another man's wife? Well, yeah, I use the word adultery. You'll probably get well. Yeah, I guess adultery is wrong. But but she was going to leave him anyway, or he. But you don't understand what a jerk he was, or he was abusing her. So, and and so it goes. We have these general categories that we to which we give some kind of assent usually, but then. When we get pressed for at the corners and the edges, our decisions become our definitions become very fuzzy, and the idea that we all agree on what's right and wrong vanishes real quick. When um, and this is a line I use a lot. It was originally um, Marsha to Jan on the Brady Bunch, but this time it's different. Why is that? Because this time it's me. Yeah, yeah. It changes then, and the universality evaporates in the details. Um, and this is this is something we have to watch. So back to this, uh, and we'll have to develop this more next time. But in this this context of okay, we all agree that we should be all men of goodwill, uh, loving our neighbor, doing it others as others would we would have others do to us. That kind of morality, if we just all got back to that, like our founding fathers, then that will change America. <laughs> Um, whose law is this anyway? And um, God, okay, which God? And how does he reveal himself? Well, we all know we did. We don't. And yes, it's our fault for not knowing. We have chosen the path of blindness. And here I mentioned the rich man in hell, so I, sh I think I should um, at least bring him up and we can end with this. But feel free to add. The rich man in hell looks up and and... One, does not acknowledge God, ever. His prayer is directed toward a human being, a saint, to, toward Abraham. Uh, he, had, he acknowledges the fact of torment that he's hurting. He, wants, he does not acknowledge it as a just punishment because he wants it to be alleviated. He does not want to acknowledge that, that he ought to be there because he kind of tries to get out by saying, well, send Lazarus back to my brethren. So they don't come here, and it's easy to say, oh, see, he loves his brother. No, what he's trying to prove is that he did not have adequate warning. They will not believe, Abraham says, let, let them hear Moses and the prophets. They have the word of God. He says, no, Father Abraham, but if they will not believe that, but if one rose from the dead, they would believe. In other words, I didn't have enough warning. And Abraham says, if they have not Moses and the prophets, they will not believe the one rose from the dead. And we, we look at that, and often the conclusion is, see, miracles do not change people's heart. I think there's something far more profound. This guy's in hell. How much more evidence do you need that God is and that God is angry <laughs> with you? And yet, he will not believe. He's still thinking ethically, it's not fair that I'm here. Well, mm -hmm. you, you have an idea of fairness. Good for you. You know what love looks like because you're using it to disguise your motives. Oh, let him save my brothers. And yet he tries to whip Lazarus around like an errand boy from paradise to hell and to earth. The Bible says that hell is a place where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. The weeping is obvious. It hurts. Gnashing of teeth is anger. People in hell are still angry against God. And think here in a very mild form of Lewis's The Great Divorce. People in hell still resent God, hate God, uh, they still play games with his law. If I had my rights, I wouldn't be here. But it is not enough to move them to morality, nor is it enough for them to give them hard and fast definitions when, when difficult questions come up. It is insufficient. Not because general revelation is insufficient, but because they have put out their own eyes. They've hardened their hearts. They have step-by-step step chosen not to listen. And as a culture, 
sinks deeper and deeper into epistemological self-consciousness, an active hatred of God and Christ, where it's not simply implied, it's out in the open, it's in the marketplace of we will not have this man to rule over, this Christianity is tyranny, there's not much left there. And to say, can't we all just agree to be good and get along, is not the answer. The answer is still Jesus Christ. The answer is still the preaching of the gospel in a non-apologetic way. But to do that, you have to tell people they're sinners and that they've sinned against an absolute standard, against the God who has spoken and whom they actually do know and whom they're sinning against. Because if they didn't know God, they wouldn't hate him and they wouldn't be sinners. They do know God. They are sinners. And their hope is Christ. I do just want to say at the end, uh, we should also be preaching the gospel in an apologetics way. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> With apologetics. Apologetics yeah. as a form of evangelism. Yeah, well, you know what? I would like each of you to explain in your own words apologetics, because, you know, a lot of people don't know what that means. It sounds mm -hmm. like we're sorry. Or we're being, <laughs> we're making, I'm sorry to tell you that. I'm sorry I have to tell you about Jesus. So, so Brian, how would you... For, for a young Christian, how would you explain it, what apologetics is or what you meant by saying that? I would, I would say in its simplest form, it is argument, but not in the way that it is normally used in English today as, oh, these two people had an argument with each other. They were mad. Mm -hmm. It is an argument. It is a setting forth of a case, and it is a setting forth of a desired, a command, commanded response. Mm -hmm. Emily? Do you have anything to add, or would you say it in a different way? Uh, just the basic definition of the word would be word against. The apo mm -hmm. is against, mm -hmm. logos is something you say, whether it's a word or a piece of reasoned speech. And I think the typical and appropriate scripture text is being ready to give a defense. Mm -hmm. um, so you're you're sharing the gospel with somebody and they have an objection because they're a sinner and they hate God. You show them, Hey, this, uh, this obstacle isn't really in the way what's really in the way. Yeah. Um, so whether it's pointing out that they don't live according to what they're arguing or that that what doesn't really match up with reality that they can't deny just sort of bringing all of God's reality to bear on your conversation about the gospel, because it's always about Jesus. Yeah. That's that's the end goal, is bringing them to Jesus. But I appreciate you saying bringing all of reality to bear. We're not saying that you can't point at nature. Right. We're saying that you have to do it in terms of their own sin and in terms of Christ. Mm -hmm. That there there is a room there is room for saying God has not left Himself without witness. Paul does that, and that He gave us fruitful seasons and, and food and such, mm -hmm. but. That, but you will not hear that because you're not thankful to God. Well, no, it's because there is no God. And then you continue the argument. How do you know that? All right. Well, great. I think that's probably a good place to end and jump to recommendations, assuming we have them. I have one because Yay. I was hating on Batman either earlier. Yeah. Um, I'm going to recommend the Lego Batman movie, which is one of my <laughs> favorites. Um, but I also have a more serious recommendation, and that is uh, Cornelius Van Til's little book on the Protestant doctrine of scripture. Mm. Um, he talks about the perspicuity of general revelation, how yeah. we can understand generalization or general revelation truly, even though we can't understand it exhaustively and our minds are corrupt, so our understanding is corrupt, yet nature still speaks to us. So sometimes Van Til mm -hmm. gets a, a misunder an, an undeserved bad rep for um, neglecting general revelation when yeah. he kind of actually wrote a book about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, right? yeah, I mean, I also think in that same vein that it's very easy to basically say, okay, we only use scripture. We only use special revelation. There's no... We, we can't even really understand anything about God from nature. It is only special mm -hmm. revelation where we learn anything about him. That's a opposite ditch to fall into, um, where the atheist or the uh, spiritual list that's not a believer 
entirely relies on nature and says, oh, yes, well, we believe in the great everything or something along those lines. We can use both. We're allowed to use both. <laughs> yeah, when, when Paul stands on Mars Hill, he's looking at Epicureans who put God far off and Stoics who are basically pantheists. One emphasizes God's transcendence, the other his eminence. And he's able to say at least, okay, you Stoics, you say God, and you know, actually both of you, you both say that God is not of a nature that can be put in, in, into physical shape. In other words, you both ought to be opposed to idols. Look around the city. Where's your opposition to idols? <laughs> your worldview should have compelled you to reject idolatry, and yet you tolerate and embrace it. So whoever or whatever God is, even by your own standards, you're guilty, let alone mm -hmm. by the standards of the God who really is. And in, so in a related, oh, go ahead. Yeah, no, go ahead. I was just going to say, in a related way as well, um, when we talk about the what we know of God from special revelation as well, it's very easy to think that theologians of the past were basically saying, you can't know anything about God. It's literally incomprehensible. There's nothing you can understand about him. But the balancing point is that what God reveals of himself beyond what we know of him from nature is true. We we actually yeah. know true things about God. It's just that he he is so transcendent compared to our finite minds. We cannot fully exhaustively know him the same way that we fully exhaustively know that I'm sitting in a chair. Um, <laughs> do we even but, fully, but do we exhaustively, even fully know exhaustively know that? Fully exhaustively know that, yeah. <laughs> it's like, no, but we can truly know it. We yes, can, right. we can There's truly this know distinction it. just as the corrupt mind can know ethics, mm -hmm. can know that there is justice. They can truly sense that, but they don't understand all the implications or faithfully yeah. interpret all the in implications. And the depending on who you are and what culture you come out of, you may be clearer on some things than on others. Mm -hmm. uh, you may you may come from a culture that understands that marriage is one man, one woman. Mm -hmm. Or you may come from a culture that scoffs at that and says how ridiculous men should have as many wives and concubines as they want. Um, both In both, there's going to be, if it's not originating in the gospel, there's going to be one may be more, both are going to be wrong to some extent, but one's a lot more wrong than the other. Yeah. <laughs> and, and and the people who get the monogamy part, they are understanding God and Christian ethics in a, after a fashion better than the others. Even though they might also be cannibals. Yeah. They may be, they may be wrong in some other area. So yeah, as you're saying, there are true things we can know about God, and about ethics, but nobody's got it all together. Um, not even every tribe and family. So yeah, we as as we do apologetics, we look for the weak spots of okay. Well, you're on board with this and this and this. Wait, how about that? Oh, well, that's different. Okay, now we we know where we differ and why. I'm sorry, Brian. Go ahead. What were you going to say? I don't think it's actually entirely all that relevant now that I'm thinking. <laughs> so okay, that's fine. Did you have a um, recommendation, or did I dismiss it? No, um, I I do. And I haven't said it yet. I'm going to recommend an album mm. by Bastille, mm. who happens to be my wife's favorite musical artist. I think I think it's his first one. I actually don't know the order release of any of his albums. I just know that this it is called Wild World. And what's interesting is that Bastille writes it, it's a group. So like if I say him or them, it, it, it's a group. They write these lyrics that are really, really, really interesting and, and quite deep when you reflect on them. I think one of his later albums, it's kind of like he starts off and it's like uh, Proverbs. It's like, oh, yeah, you I don't mean like in the sense that it's inspired or even biblical, just like <laughs> it has the same <laughs> attitude as Proverbs. Uh -huh. Like, look, if you do great things, you like you like go out and have uh, enjoy reality and do good things and like you, you can enjoy life, basically. Mm -hmm. A couple albums later, it's Ecclesiastes, <laughs> where it's like he's he's this per, he's he's got this kind of viewpoint that is very much there is there is logic and there is order and these are things we should strive for, and he doesn't have Christ, so that's all collapsing around him, and it's it's kind of like well, what is there under the sun? 
it, there's nothing but to toil and 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 eat bread and die. Yeah. That's it. It's very interesting. But the first album's very good, very musically rich and incredible. There's a song on there called Blame, which is really, really good. Um, so if you listen through it in order and get to blame and you don't like it by that point, then you can just disregard all of my future musical. <laughs> um, I want to uh, recommend a paperback book uh, by one Scott McLeod. It is called Understanding the Invisible Art Comics or Understanding Car- Comics, the Invisible Art, I guess is how it should hmm. be. It is about comics, how they are different from other art forms, particularly comics as we would think of a comic book, not just a comic strip. He makes a distinction and shows why they're not the same thing. But he tells it using a comic book. (laughs) Well, that's great. Yeah. I mean, there are a few pages of text, but most of it is just comic panels. And he shows you how panels work, how the art within them works, how one thing that that struck me is you go from uh, one panel to another. It's not like a film where the film is constantly running and you see everything that happens between this shot and that shot. It's more like the cutaways where something's happening. You cut away to the outside, see the lightning in the sky, hear a scream, and you cut back in and you see a body <laughs> like that. You didn't see what happened. Yeah. Your imagination fills in everything between one panel and the next. And the question becomes, and why did you imagine it that way? <laughs> and what exactly did you imagine? Um, Leaves well, some mystery. Huh? It, yeah, it's that and, sounds really and, good. And it is, in that sense, very, very mysterious. Is why does the human mind do what it does the way it does? My only caveat is there is one scene where I think he's discussing, I don't know, the history of comics or something, and there are a whole bunch of little pictures on it, and I mean pictures, very small. But uh, a couple of them do have a bit of nudity. Ah. So I don't know that she would want to hand this to a um, a junior high student or maybe even immature high school students. But for an adult, <laughs> it's not going to be a problem. Uh, the rest of it is, is, as far as I remember, clean. And it does it talks about how it works, why it works, and why it's so powerful. It also discusses the history of comics going all the way back to hieroglyphics mm. and things like that. Mm. And... Um, was recommended to me, oddly enough, by one of my former students who said, you got to add this to the reading list. Uh, <laughs> I don't think I quite can, but I, I was tempted. If I cut out a couple of pages, I would. It's uh, If you've ever read comic books, uh, even even somewhat and were, and were interested in them, especially if, if you read them regularly, I think this is something you should read. And it gives you a yeah. better idea of how this art form affects our brains why it works the way it does and what it's capable of accomplishing and how it has not yet reached its full potential. So hmm. understanding comics, Scott McCloud. I don't know if it's from that book or if I just, I saw something similar sometime in the last month, but there is an aspect of that where it's like, yeah, in this frame, there's like three bubbles of dialogue, mm-hmm. but the action moment that you're seeing is the end of the conversation where the hero has decided to punch the villain in the face. Yeah. And it's like, yeah, they're not talking while he's like posing like this <laughs> about to punch him, but you understand yeah. the 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 narrative and temporal flow well enough just by nature of how storytelling works. That could well be this because there is something like that there and how okay. we what um I forget the word. I'm not doing well with words these days, am I? The conventions that yeah. we have come to adopt so that we all together understand that. Someone coming to the first time, how is he talking and saying all these things while he's punching the girl? You know, no, that's, <laughs> you read it in order. How? So. <laughs> Emily, did you, you, you gave a recommendation then, didn't yeah, you? Yeah, I gave okay. two actually. I cheated. That's right. We all gave recommendations then. We're yeah, good. Yeah. <laughs> Well, thank you both so much for joining me for this conversation and for giving such good recommendations as well to all of our listeners this time. Thank you for joining us. If you'd like to follow us, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel. You can follow us on Rumble. We're on Substack now. You can like our Facebook page where it is moderately active. Uh, and if you'd <laughs> It's like very to... quiet. Sounds <laughs> like crickets there. Oh, it's crickets now. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, you can you can listen to the course of crickets if you go to our Facebook page now instead. Uh, if you'd like to subscribe to us, we're on all the podcast catchers. Uh, let us know if we're not. 
If you'd like to reach out to us with comments or questions you'd like to have us answer on on the air, so to speak, uh, you can email us at haltingtowardszion at gmail.com. You can also support us financially if you feel so led to do uh, at anchor.fm forward slash haltingtowardszion. Humongous thank you to our current financial supporters. You helped make the show possible. And thanks to David Maxson, our producer, for editing all the episodes and getting these out to our audience. We hope to see you next time. Have a great one. Bye.